Okay, welcome to the 320 or so clinicians who have joined us for tonight's webinar. The webinar is organized by the Mental Health Professionals Network. Now, the title of this webinar is Collaborative Mental Health Care, Older Persons and Sleep Disturbances. Yeah. I'm Shantha Rajaratnam and I'll be f facilitating tonight's session. Uh, I'm a professor of psychology at Monash University in Melbourne and I currently serve as the president of the Australasian Sleep Association, which is the peak body representing sleep clinicians and researchers in Australia and New Zealand. We're privileged to have such a stellar group uh, of clinicians in our panel tonight and I'd like to begin by uh, introducing this panel to you. First, I'd like to uh, introduce Dr. Richard Kidd, who is joining us from Queensland. Now, you can't see Richard, uh, but he's certainly with us by phone. Unfortunately, his camera is not working, so he's going to participate in this webinar uh, by phone. Uh, Richard will be providing a GP perspective on the panel. Uh, welcome, Richard. Hi. Uh, it's great to have you with us. Uh, I see that you're a GP with a special interest in aged care. Can you tell us a little bit about how this came about? Uh, well, I, at one point I was actually thinking of being a geriatrician when I was um, a very young doctor in New Zealand and um, I was in an accelerated physician training program and uh, the Auckland Hospital had a geriatric um, uh, acute admitting unit attached to the main body of the hospital and I was uh, admitting and discharging patients every day and the love of looking after um, aged people really started then and has never left me even though I've gone off and done other things like be a volunteer in Papua New Guinea. All right. Well, it's great to have you with us, Richard. So joining Richard is uh, Professor Colette Browning, who's a health psychologist based in Victoria and an expert in healthy ageing uh, and behaviour change science. Uh, welcome, Colette. Thank you, Shanta. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about how your research uh, is influencing the way practitioners are, um, are managing health problems in older persons? Oh, well, um, we have a longitudinal study in Melbourne on healthy ageing and we've been examining um, what are the predictors of good outcomes in old age. And interestingly, a lot of those predictors are actually um, health behaviours like physical activity and, and good eating, but also we've found that um, sleep is an important predictor of healthy ageing. So I was very pleased to be in, invited to participate on the, on the panel because obviously Sleep is an important issue for older people and uh, contributes significantly to their well-being in old age. Well, it's great to have you on the panel, Colette. Uh, next in our panel is Dr. Rod McKay, who is a New South Wales-based psychiatrist uh, who works with older people. Uh, I notice uh, that you work across community residential care and inpatient settings, Rod. Do you see sleep disturbances impacting on health and quality of life across all of these settings? To what extent do you see it? Oh, there's no doubt that in all those settings, sleep disturbance um, happens for many reasons and has quite a profound effect on quality of life. So it's a very important issue and very important to not mismanage it. So pleasure to be here tonight. Thanks, Rod. So, uh, and last but not least, I'd like to introduce Dr. David Cunnington, who's a sleep physician based in Victoria, uh, well known for his breadth of expertise uh, in all aspects of sleep medicine. Uh, welcome, David. Thanks, Shantha. David, what prompted you as a physician to develop such strong expertise in behavioural and psychological treatments for sleep? Uh, unfortunately, once I got really interested in sleep, it was unavoidable. <laughs> There's just such an interaction between how we behave, the society we live in, how we live our lives and how we sleep that uh, I couldn't get away from it. Well, it's uh, great to have you on board, David. So uh, I, I note that the audience would have uh, seen the ground rules for these webinars that are coordinated by the Mental Health Professionals Network. I'm not going to go through them again, but I remind you of these uh, particular rules. So uh, the learning objectives are shown uh, on the slide there. Uh, our aim through an interdisciplinary panel discussion about this particular case study, Wayne, an older person who may be experiencing mental health issues uh, and or sleep disturbances, we will raise awareness of the link between mental health and sleep disturbances, identify the key principles of the featured panelists' approach in assessing, treating and supporting Wayne, and also identify the merits, challenges and opportunities in providing collaborative care for Wayne. Now, uh, we know that sleep loss 
uh, and sleep disorders are increasingly common and are associated with a wide range of health consequences, including hypertension, cognitive impairment and mood disturbances, all of which we note uh, in the case study today. Now, there's a critical need to increase knowledge among mental health practitioners about the impact of sleep disorders and appropriate management practices. So looking specifically at the case study of Wayne, we note that he's a 67-year-old man who has retired from a job that involved shift work about five years ago. He has a history of high blood pressure, slightly overweight, snores loudly, and reports being awake for much of the night. His wife is concerned about recent episodes of memory loss and his uh, depression. Now, Wayne himself recognizes that he's tired during the day, but really thinks that this is a, this, these health problems are a part of him uh, becoming old. So let's consider what our panelists recommend for Wayne and also for Bev. Now, I'll ask each panelist now to give a short discipline-specific response to this case study. And then we'll take questions uh, across the panel and we'll also start to uh, look at some of the questions that you have all asked as the audience. So I'd like to now hand over to Richard to discuss his response to the case study. Uh, Richard, over to you. Well, there are a few things as the, the GP with this couple coming in. The first is that uh, Wayne is not necessarily uh, at this point a, a willing participant. Um, he's been dragged in by his wife, Bev, and uh, thankfully at the the end of the introduction bet between Bev and Wayne, there is a segue for the GP to be able to um, maybe get some engagement with Wayne when he turns around and says, well, Doc, you know, just tell her it's uh, ageing and there's nothing much you can do about it, is there? And that's the point where uh, the GP can say, well, actually, Wayne, no, this may not just be ageing. You know, there are a number of things that you've um, described there and that Bev's described that, you know, we could look at and maybe we could make things a whole lot better for you and have you feeling much, much better. And uh, so that will give us an opportunity to then think about some investigations and um, involving other people and sorting things out with them. Um, it's probably a bit too early for a differential diagnosis, but uh, you know, clearly if there's been weight change, if he's got pain, um, if there's mood problems, cognition problems, um, if he's breathless, you know, all of these things the GP needs to think about and that will devolve down into things like you know, whether he might have diabetes, um, prostatism, maybe something a bit more sinister with his prostate, whether he's suffering with sleep apnea. So. The, the GP needs to think about all of those things as well as uh, obviously dementia and depression. And the other really important thing I think is that when you have a couple presenting like this is, um, is Bev depressed? Is, is she the one who's not sleeping as well? And what about her pain control? So, you know, the GP really has to look at, at the, the, the dynamics of the couple. So um, certainly blood and urine tests for Wayne, um, more history and family history around dementia and depression, as well as diabetes and prostate problems. And, um, you know, as is probably often the case, they probably didn't make a long appointment. So part of it is trying to get the engagement for them to come back to work them up for a comprehensive mental health assessment, looking at cognition and mood and um, considering referrals to maybe a sleep physician, psychologist. Um, so uh, I think the GP in that first session really has to just get some engagement and explain there's a few things to sort out and there'll be a few other people to involve in the process probably. Well, thank you, Richard. I think this is a, a great uh, segue really into uh, Colette's perspective as a, as a health psychologist. So, Colette, perhaps I'll hand over to you now. Thank you, Shanta. Yes, I'm taking a, a health psychologist perspective, but also, um, uh, obviously, I, I work in the field of gerontology, so I'm also looking at some that as well. I've just got a message on my machine about activating the camera. Here we go. Good. I'm back again. Uh, so I think the perspective of a health psychologist is very interesting because although we, we've obviously trained as a, um, in psychological uh, principles, we try and look at the interrelationships between physical, cognitive and mental health issues, and in this case, um, sleep disturbance, in the context of age-related changes and expectations. So. From the gerontology perspective, um, what I'm interested in is looking at uh, age-related changes and how these might um, impact. So in later life, um, sleep quality has actually been shown to be an independent risk factor for falls and depression and can actually inhibit recovery from illness. So once again, this interrelationship between sleep and 
physical problems as well as mental health problems is very much in the realm of the health psychologist who can who, who would be able to assist Wayne. Um, also, I think Shanta's pointed out that um, quality, good quality sleep is also important for cognitive functioning and memory consolidation. And again, we have to look at this case from that perspective as well. A lot of older people assume that um, if they've, they've got poor memory, that it's because they're getting older, but it may be because they have a physical problem that's contributing to that. And also, uh, because um, as we get older, we're more likely to have um, multiple chronic illness problems as well. It may be not the age that's impacting, on poor sleep, uh, sleep quality, but uh, a chronic illness that is impacting as well. So the other point I think I'd like to make is that um, sleep occurs in the con often occurs in the context of a, a personal relationship. Um, many of us don't sleep alone; we sleep with someone else. So um, sleep patterns can actually be disruptive to the partner, Beverly, in this uh, particular case. And um, people who have caregiving responsibilities may have very disrupted sleep patterns as well. So I think um, um, that we've got to consider this as a, a couple, not just the, the case of Wayne. Also, uh, Wayne attributes um, his health problems, including his wakefulness at, at, at night, as, to, as due to old um, age. And again, I want to highlight this issue of negative expectations, that one of the things we need to do as health professionals is to maybe challenge some of those negative expectations that we all hold, but also that older people themselves hold about uh, their health issues and how it's due to old age and, and cannot be helped. Is that my last slide? I'm not sure. No, we're still going. Uh, so uh, I think from any uh, health professional, we have to reassure Wayne that in later life, health problems can be treated, uh, that there are a range of treatments that are available. Uh, health psychologists will use uh, evidence-based uh, approaches and I note that there are some treatments, for example, using CBT approaches, um, particularly around insomnia that have been shown to be quite successful. The other part of this case is that uh, Wayne talks about some weight issues and um, management, um, of perhaps some chronic illnesses that he may have. And again, a health psychologist is very well suited to deal with these sorts of issues because as health psychologists, we're trained to look at this interaction between um, chronic illnesses, uh, behaviours, and uh, mental health issues. So again, we can take a, a more holistic view of this case by looking at all those factors. Thanks, Colette. I mean, that's really interesting. And I think I'd like to take, uh, you know, to pick up on one of the points that you made, particularly about the extent to which Wayne has uh, attributed a, a number of these uh, problems that he's experiencing to a part of the aging process. And I'd like to, uh, you know, in a moment, ask all of you the extent to which this then uh, is a barrier to people seeking uh, medical treatment for, uh, you know, such things as sleep disorders, cognitive impairment, and so on. But perhaps we'll get to that uh, after hearing the perspective of Rod uh, as a psychiatrist. So to Rod, I might uh, hand over to you now. Thanks, Santa. Um, so I'll click on the camera as well and get started. I think the first thing to emphasise is each psychiatrist is going to have a slightly different way of um, structuring their assessment and how they'd focus um, on the problems in this case. Um, but in general they will have a structure behind that and then the emphasis of the assessment will vary according to the training they've had. Um, their experience with similar problems, and also trying to hear what Wayne's wishes are um, and to tailor the way the assessment occurs um, to meet that, and also looking at where the, the setting of the assessment is. Um, this sounds like it's, it's in your office, but often assessments of older people aren't in, in the office. They may be in the person's home. Um, they may also be in residential care, and that has quite a big impact on the way that you actually carry out an assessment. And so therefore what you try to do is follow the patient's responses but move through all the elements of the assessment you'd like to do and make sure all the areas that need to be covered are. Um, so in general, psychiatrists look at a biopsychosocial assessment, so trying to look at um, how will the biological, the psychological and the social factors interact and actually end up with Wayne in front of you now. 
and looking for what are the factors that may predispose Wayne to having problems, what's brought him now, what's precipitating it, and what might be perpetuating those. And I think in terms of Wayne, you can see that there's a lot we don't know about Wayne, um, but we do know that as well as having a, a potential carer, he's been a carer for Bev as well, and that clearly increases the risk for both sleep and mental health problems um, in later life. What we really don't know, I'd like to know more about Wayne, is his um, family history and also personal history to make sure whether he's had any um, problems or family have had problems with depression or with um, dementia. What we then look at is actually what were the, the priority assessment issues for Wayne. And for him, the, the most important thing is going to be rapport. Because you know, Wayne has had an episode in a sh shopping centre which he, he may or may not have been worried about. His wife clearly was very worried about and has brought to a GP. And in this case, the GP is sent to a psychiatrist. Um, and so it's very likely Wayne is going to be fairly defensive coming in. And so that's going to be the most important thing. Then looking at the history and how much time you spend on that really depends on the quality of the referral information that you receive and a mental state examination. And very much depending on how receptive Wayne is, the degree of cognitive testing you do on a first assessment or whether you negotiate doing that um, at a second assessment. But trying to do some at least some brief cognitive testing um, with an instrument such as a 3MS um, is increasingly um, used in New South Wales, and then trying to develop a formulation of what the problem is, both from your perspective and from Wayne's perspective, as well as Bev, which I think moves on to actually um, what will be the priority issues to consider. One is that um, with any assessment is having a risk assessment in the back of your mind, um, knowing that older people have, and especially over 75, have got significantly more chance of completed suicide than younger people and that they, um, you don't get as many chances to intervene. So it's important to have that in the back of your mind, but particularly missed medical conditions would be what I'd be most concerned about when I was first seeing Wayne. And there's really a very broad differential diagnosis which would be starting to work through my mind and tailor the questions um, to look at those. And then think about which areas will actually impact most on initial management, which is probably going to be, in this case, particularly what is it that Wayne particularly wants to see um, addressed. And I would suspect that either clarification or reassurance about memory problems actually might be, for him come to see a psychiatrist, the biggest issue. Um, there's so much... Um, awareness raising about dementia is becoming a real problem about people actually becoming too worried about developing dementia. And so I'd be particularly concerned to make sure that was addressed. And then think about what are the future roles um, of both the psychiatrist, if it's required, um, why may not have mental health issue. Um, it, it could well be that it's only other issues, um, but make sure you're negotiating what is your role or the role of other parties. And in terms of the principles, that really will vary on who is actually involved. So mostly that treatment will be in a shared care model with the GP in an informal setting with the way that I would practice. And I, um, I think a number of psychiatrists would practice. And then looking at, in terms of an older person, how do you bring in other resources to help with social needs um, if they're required? And so it will be a combination of direct management. Um, I would be reluctant to be looking on the history we've got at medication for Wayne, but if you were looking at medication, I think the thing I'd emphasise is because someone um, may have depression and sleep disturbance doesn't mean you need an antidepressant that actually um, is sedating. And I think it's one of the, the key mistakes to avoid um, in cases like Wayne if depression is present. And then making sure you're very clearly communicating with the patient and with the GP about not just what is proposed, but what might be the side effects of what's proposed and who's going to look out for those and what to do if they occur. Cool. And that would then, I think, might skip the short term. But to look at, I think, because I think it's very similar to some of the things you've heard already, but I think thinking very much about what are the long-term priorities as well. So thinking about the fact that you may not get the diagnosis um, right first up and being quite clear um, with Wayne and Bev that 
when there's a number of possibilities, you might have to work through those and then come back to think about them and discuss with them whether the interventions you've suggested actually are working or not. And then once they do work, how do you make sure they keep working and the problems don't come back? Well, thank you, Rod. I think uh, that really leads very nicely into uh, the perspective of a sleep physician. So I'd like to uh, ask uh, uh, David Cunnington to present his perspective as a sleep physician. Actually, just before you do, David, uh, I notice there's lots of uh, uh, comments from the audience that support some of the uh, comments that were coming in before as well about different types of treatments for sleep disturbances. And I think a number of you are interested in uh, both pharmacological and non-pharmacological treatments, and certainly uh, that's something I'm going to uh, put to the panel uh, shortly after he we hear from David. So uh, over to you, David. Yeah, thanks, Chancellor. So I thought I'd start just actually with explaining what a sleep physician is, because um, it's a relatively new uh, specialty, and sometimes people don't have a good understanding of uh, what we do and sort of who we are. So we're adult physicians, so trained like cardiologists, neurologists, rheumatologists, gastroenterologists in that sort of way, so expert in managing physical problems in uh, adults, uh, and then spend some time specialising specifically in sleep and manage a whole range of sleep problems, uh, not just sleep apnea. Traditionally, um, because this has been a joint specialty with respiratory sleep medicine, there has been a bit of a focus on sleep apnea. Um, but the specialty is evolving. We've now got a very broad curriculum that requires trainees to train in insomnia and a range of sleep problems. Uh, and that's largely been driven a bit uh, by consumer demand. You know, as we're discussing tonight, people have sleep problems. Sleep problems have a major impact on their general health. So we need to be able to provide that sort of service. And if you look, really, Western medicine's not been in that space of providing good services and good help for people with sleep problems uh, up until the last sort of 15 or 20 years. Okay, so just to get on to then this specific case, so rather than talk through sort of how I'd assess Wayne, I've sort of just given a bit of a summary of my sort of feelings about the case. Uh, and the other, it may well come out, the other panellists may draw me out a bit later about sort of why I sort of come to these sort of conclusions and sort of thoughts about the case. But one of my thoughts about Wayne is that, for me, he rings of a high risk of obstructive sleep apnea. We used to do case identification for sleep apnea just based on asking questions. Do you snore? Does your spouse see apneas? But what we've found is that whilst that's quite a specific strategy, it's actually a very insensitive strategy. So if the spouse is seeing snoring and apneas, you've got a 100% hit rate. That person's got sleep apnea. So now the way we try and look for sleep apnea is actually by comorbidities. Um, so, you know, the way I teach trainees that I talk to uh, or other professional groups I talk to is that if you say you're an expert in managing diabetes and you look at your type 2 diabetics, 60% of them will have sleep apnea, snoring, not snoring, apneas, no apneas, they've got sleep apnea in 60% of those patients. Um, if you look at a population of people with depression or treatment-resistant depression, which is a large proportion of the waiting room, often in psychiatric practices, a good 60% of those patients have sleep apnea sight unseen, not just based on symptoms of sleep apnea. So we're going much more to this comorbidity-based uh, diagnosis of sleep apnea just because the, that's what the prevalence data, data uh, confirms and that's how we should look at it. So if you look at Wayne's comorbidities, you know, odds to apples, he's going to have uh, obstructive sleep apnea. And if he's got sleep apnea, for me, it's going to be important to treat because he's feeling tired. That's sort of part of um, the presentation. Uh, and there's this interrelationship between sleep apnea and depression. So sleep apnea itself increases the incident rate of depression, um, sort of new depression. Um, so there's this relationship between having sleep apnea and the future development of depression. Okay, where's my slides up to? Okay, so I'm up to my next slide. So I also think Wayne has um, in, insomnia, and that's based on a symptom syndrome definition. So DSM-4 describes insomnia as either difficulty getting to sleep, uh, non-restorative sleep, um, or difficulty staying asleep, and symptoms for more than a month and having an impact on uh, daytime functioning. So he meets that diagnostic criteria for insomnia and probably it's comorbid insomnia rather than just primary uh, insomnia. And my feeling is that 
insomnia is important to treat because we've got good data that insomnia itself increases the risk of depression and some data that, you know, Shant has been very involved in some of this sort of work that if we treat insomnia itself, you actually get improvements in depression outcomes. Um, so very important in this case if we think depression is part of the presenting symptomatology. David, to what extent did in, in your uh, determination of high risk of obstructive sleep apnea and insomnia, what about the cognitive impairment that, uh, that Richard spoke about as well? Yeah. Uh, uh, to be honest, I don't know what to make of that. You know, there's so many potential contributing factors to the cognitive impairment that I think the only way you're going to sort of skin that is like peeling an onion and just take out one layer at a time and see does that change um, his symptoms. For, and for example, that's where managing sleep apnea comes in in this case, because that's potentially one layer that you can take out. Manage the sleep apnea, see the effect it has on cognitive function. Then manage the next layer, manage the depression, see the effect that has on cognitive function. And I'm happy, you know, interested in the comments of the of um, Rod and Colette about whether there's more specific things you can do to try and tease out why he's got cognitive impairment. But for, as a physician, I I find that hard to work out the why, what's causing the cognitive oh, impairment. Yeah. It's a bit hard, I think. It's a bit of a chicken and egg one, that too, because yeah. um, often older people who are depressed show signs of cognitive impairment. Um, and also, you know, you talked about the comorbid con conditions. There's a fair bit of evidence now that, um, um, you know, things like, um, you know, diabetes, for example, um, are contributing to... Um, cognitive problems in, in old age as well. So I think in this case, um, you know, we're looking at probably treating a number of the con conditions simultaneously, or maybe with some similar types of treatments. And it, it might, might be a bit difficult to know, um, you know, which, where you're getting your, your effect. But um, um, I think it's important to, to look at the whole perspective here and look at some of those other conditions and how they might be interrelating uh, with uh, sleep problems. Yeah, thanks, thanks, yeah. Colette. So, as you can see from my slide, my, my plan would be refer him to you. <laughs> That's sort of <laughs> largely my plan. So, so my sort of next steps for Wayne. So, if I'd seen him as a new consult, um, my next steps would be one, do a sleep study to look at sleep apnea, but then in parallel with that, get help from a mental health professional. And because I sort of co-consult with psychologists, I've just got that availability. So it would be a health psychologist like yourself, uh, Colette, or a clinical psychologist. Um, but yeah, I'm also interested in the views from Rod and the rest of the panel about, well, should I refer to a psychiatrist or should I refer to a psychologist? And we'll, we'll get into that discussion oh. a bit later. Oh. So uh, thanks so much, David. I think uh, there's lots of questions that I, I, you know I think we can uh, start to ask each other, and uh, and and that really opened up some of them. So I'd like to um, start by asking uh, perhaps Rod to uh, you know you Rod you had a question that you'd like to uh, pose to Colette uh, in particular about uh, how to consider. Uh, non-medical -men, uh, mental health, how do non-medical -men, uh, men, uh, mental health professionals uh, meet the challenges and what can doctors do to assist? Would you like to ask uh, uh, Colette your, your particular question? Uh, I mean, Colette, I suspect is, is an exception, but I think one of the questions that I get frequently raised um, with me from psychologists as well as from others is actually that um, with limited training about older people and about medical issues, um, how do they best actually therefore incorporate those issues in their management? Um, and how do they know how to adapt their interventions if there's some cognitive impairment present if they haven't had formal training in how to do that? And then in terms of collaborative care, how, how can the psychiatrist or, or doctors help psychologists in coping with those issues? Yeah, look, I, I think this is a really good um, question and, and as I said earlier, um, as health psychologists, we're really trained to look at that interaction between um, particularly chronic conditions and mental health issues. So uh, I think health psychologists are well placed to under, understand those interactions, but I agree in terms of the training in um, dealing with older people is still quite limited in, in much of our training, be it psychology um, or, or other health professions. So 
I think um, part of part of this is to sort of understand that as we age, um, we're increasing. There's an increasing chance of various chronic conditions that may be influencing our mental health. So. Um, even very common conditions like arthritis, um, which is maybe causing pain in older people, are going to uh, contribute perhaps to their difficulty in, in sleeping, causing restlessness, restlessness at night, for example. Um, and multiple chronic conditions are often associated um, with depression. So I think for um, a, a non-medical mental health professional, they just need to really be aware of what those um, con comorbid conditions that their client may have. And I think with a, a collaborative care approach, a team a a approach, um, we need to be able to um, get information from our, from our clients about how some of those chronic illnesses may be impacting on the particular issue that they're coming to see us about, whether it be uh, depression or and or sleep disorder, as in in this case, uh, in terms of cognitive changes, uh, again, I think we um, we need to adapt our interventions uh, for that. But but in reality, you know, most older people, the type of cognitive changes we're seeing is quite minor. And I was interested in the comment um, before about. Um, it might have been you, Rod, actually, who said that you know people worry about you know just because they're old and they forget something one day they think oh my god I'm getting dementia. Well, I think again this is a we we need to be able to reassure older people that that um, uh, you know forgetfulness doesn't mean you're going to get severe uh, cognitive impairment. Well, and, I mean, Colette, yeah. that's a great. Uh, I mean, you, you I think we're interested in this uh, issue of. Uh, you know uh, the the view that uh, that Wayne had put forward that perhaps you know this is just a part of aging and I, I'd like oh. I, I understand you've got a question that you know you might like to ask uh, Richard and and perhaps Rod about as a perspective of GP and a psychiatrist uh, about age stereotypes. Hmm. Yes. Well, I I think all us health professionals need to challenge these age stereotypes. Um, we see them in older people themselves, as in the, the case we're looking at now, where older people themselves will attribute negative um, health issues to old age and, and then think, well, there's nothing much we can do about it. So I think part of, um, part of what we need to do is, is reassure and maybe challenge older people that, that yes, there are uh, evidence-based treatments that can assist them with their uh, concerns, but also in the training of health professionals. Um, I'd be interested to know um, from you, Rod and Richard, how, how do you see that playing out? As, as do you, have you seen any changes in the training of health professionals to help address the often ageist um, attitudes that health professionals have? Um, yes. People? Yes, it's Richard. Uh, in terms of the training, as a, a GP um, supervisor, I am involved in training medical students and registrars, and um, I have a, a fairly big practice, and we also train nurses, and we have some uh, psychology um, uh, undergraduates here, and we have a, a few psychologists working with us as well. So we're involved in training um, people across the board in health professions and um, have a number of other um, specialties in, in, under our roof. And a ch a challenging ageism is certainly um, a very important thing. And I might just quickly share one little story with you. Um, I remember very fondly a little um, Scottish lady who was 104 years old. And uh, she was developing some arthritis at the age of 104 in her knee. She was a very strong matriarch. Her children were in their 70s and 80s. And, and uh, they, they still very much kowtowed to mum. But anyway, she was uh, walking using a um, uh, umbrella, one of those ones with the hollow metal stems and the sharp spike on the bottom. And as a GP, I could see a disaster happening. One of these days, it was going to flex and flick up and, and slice her leg open. And I turned around to her and said, Elizabeth, look, I think it's really time to start using a walking stick. Don't, don't use your um, umbrella to support yourself. And she turned around in a nice Scottish brogue and said, oh, doctor, I cannot be doing that. I don't want people thinking I'm old. <laughs> and she was 104. And she, she continued to be in good shape until she was 107 or 108. 
And uh, she was a beautiful example of someone who was cognitively intact, fiercely independent, still very much in control of her family, her financial affairs and everything else up until about the age of 106. And I've got a lot of other patients who are in their 90s who um, are absolutely independent, they drive to my surgery, and it's great for medical students, nursing students, psychology students, to be able to see these healthy people coming in for checkups, and some of them are on no medication, or maybe just one or two medications. And yet at the other extreme, I've got 30 and 40 year olds who are diabetic, have got a bit of heart failure, um, all sorts of other problems, and some of them will be on 15 different medications. So it's not ageism, it's about recognizing what conditions people have and treating them. And one of the things you were saying before about the sleep deprivation and the cognitive impairment, I think that's a really important thing to reinforce. As a GP, I'm well aware of uh, things like with my, um, I'm also involved a bit in um, uh, supervising young doctors, and there's all this fatigue management around them now because we've recognized that if a person goes without significant sleep for 48, 72 hours, they basically behave like someone who's drunk. They have got significant yeah. acute cognitive impairment. So when you've got a patient who is not sleeping because of pain or because they're having to get up to pass uh, urine frequently through the night or they've got sleep apnea or some other problems, you've got to address those problems and quite often that apparent cognitive impairment disappears when you fix the problems and they can sleep. Yeah. Yes. I, I, I absolutely agree with that and I think that's, that needs to be the focus rather than the age of the person themselves. Right. I might uh, just, we're going to sort of address some of the audience questions in a moment. Rod, did you have anything to add to direct us to resources that might be useful in addressing Colette's point about uh, age stereotypes? Yeah, I think just briefly, um, I think one is, is just to note that actually psychiatrists do subtrain in old age. Um, and have brought in um, competencies for everyone. So I think you can in training address it that way. But in terms of resources, I think the most important resource is hearing from older people themselves. Mm. Um, and so I think some of the things that people should be aware of is that COTA with Beyond Blue actually run Beyond Maturity Blues, which is a peer oh. um, program. So it's older people talking to older people um, with a reported very good outcomes. And the University of Birmingham has got um, videos on the web which actually are older people talking about their recovery from depression um, in an incredibly positive and powerful way. So I think um, using those resources and people looking at those resources is incredibly important. And I think also trying to get a couple of positive ageing figures that are in your mind yourself. I mean, things like 80% of people at 80 won't have dementia. Thinking about the, the, the countryside or some of the negative messages um, that we often hold in our heads as health professionals. Thanks, uh, thanks, Rod. I think what I might do now is one of the common uh, threads in the discussion that's coming uh, forward from the audience is a discussion about uh, non-pharmaceutical um, uh, pharmacological treatments uh, for sleep disturbances, and you know people are asking about uh, uh, about yoga about practical sleep strategies, uh, hypnotherapy, and so on. Now, I might uh, start by directing this to David Cunnington because there is a strong evidence base, David, uh, and, and you're an expert in this area, in terms of behavioral and psychological management of sleep disturbances. Do you want to just talk a little bit more about that, that evidence base? Yeah, sure. So there's a really good evidence base for a package of treatments that's bundled as cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia, CBTI, um, both in healthy adults but also in elderly populations, both healthy elderly and institutionalised elderly as well. Um, so really good data showing it's an effective strategy for improving sleep as well as improving other out outcomes like general quality of life but also depression, anxiety, th those type of outcomes as well. There's really five core components to CBTI. Um, and everyone talks about sleep hygiene. There's a few things in the post, the, the chat box about sleep hygiene. So in, in meta-analysis, sleep hygiene comes fifth out of five in terms of effectiveness, so it's last. And in the last 10 years, sleep hygiene's been the control condition for most research on CBTI. So we really think that's the effect it has. Um, and often because it's the most readily available thing that people can find, they're trying very hard with sleep hygiene. They've got a very careful pre-sleep routine and they're controlling the environment. 
but that actually is very counteractive and perpetuates a lot of the insomnia because it puts a lot of the focus on trying too hard to control sleep. So rather than focusing on sleep hygiene, really it's a banner of just make sure they're respectful of sleep hygiene But right, and after that, you know what, that's enough. So the other four components of CBTI, the, the most powerful components are called sleep restriction and stimulus control. And the essence of those two components is matching the time in bed more closely to the amount of sleep people mm -hmm. are actually getting. Uh, and stimulus control, if you're in bed and awake and don't feel like you're going to go back to bed, get up, get out of bed, wait till that feeling that you're going to sleep returns. Yep. Uh, they're really the two most powerful components, behavioural components, but they're quite challenging because it really shakes up a lot of the behavioural coping strategies people have had around sleep. If people haven't slept well, they're used to going to bed a bit earlier, sleeping in a bit later to catch a bit more sleep and they've coped with that strategy over some time and now you're telling them to just completely throw that out and literally uh, using a, something that's called sleep restriction when they're fearful about not sleeping. You know, it's quite a challenging uh, sort of process. So we try and then incorporate that with one of the other two, two components of CBTI, relaxation strategies uh, and cognitive therapy. So challenging some of those um, disordered cognitions people get around sleep. If I don't sleep for X amount of hours, this bad outcome will occur. Mm. Um, yeah. uh, well, that's really uh, helpful, David. And another uh, you know, consistent comment that we're getting is, how do we know when to treat with uh, these cognitive behavioral strategies that you've been talking about and when to treat with benzodiazepines? Uh, of course, we know that they're widely used in, in general practice. Uh, and more recently, melatonin. Uh, as a treatment for these sorts of sleep disturbance. So, uh, Richard, I might ask you, uh, when you, uh, a patient presents with significant insomnia, how do, we make the, or how do you make the determination of what would be the appropriate line of treatment, uh, benzodiazepines, melatonin, and cognitive behavioral? I try very fiercely to resist starting anyone on a benzodiazepine. Um, there are a few um, very restricted occasions in which I will and that's like uh, you know during an acute bereavement or some other fairly major trauma and I'll make it very clear that you know the person in that situation where they've got uh, very high levels of anxiety and they're hypervigilant and quite distressed um, and it's an acute setting uh, in that setting I will you know be very careful in making it well understood that they shouldn't use the benzos more than three or four times a week otherwise uh, rightly or wrongly I say that within two weeks of taking them every night they're going to stop working and they're going to be addicted to them and they're, they're going to find that they get um, increased anxiety as they start to wear off and then they're going to feel the need to take some more and have no benefit so I try very hard to resist the benzos and I try to get people off them who come to me um, I think, uh, particularly if we go back to Wayne, one of the uh, things that uh, I mentioned uh, in response to other people is this guy is drinking a lot of tea during the day. Um, there are a lot, a lot of times you can look at people's lifestyle and um, some of the things that they're doing that are actually going to interfere with their sleep. And um, another thing with him is physical activity. Um, a lot of people, when they have stopped working and are in retirement or semi-retirement have given up their physical activity and if they can get back into regular exercise that's another thing that can help reset things for them. Mm. So, yes and I, I would agree with that. Um, I think some of those um, health behaviours are very important in terms of um, assisting this case Wayne in terms of um, his sleep but also I think we noted in the case um, that he had he was slightly overweight so one of the approaches a health psychologist might take with this is to actually look at helping him reduce his weight um, through increasing his physical activity, for example. Yes. So um, how do you... Uh, uh, David, do you have any comments about, when, when in your practice, the decision to treat uh, with, with, with the cognitive behavioural uh, therapies versus the benzodiazepines? And perhaps you could also comment on when it's appropriate to use melatonin, uh, particularly uh, there was lots of questions from the audience about the use of melatonin for elderly with insomnia. Sure. So, so if I break it up into sort of when do I use a drug and when do I use a non-drug strategy, and then I'll mm -hmm. talk a bit about which drug. Um, essentially, I'd use a non-drug strategy all the time. So always trying to give 
um, some type of CBT because there's always some type of behavioural things we can do to get sleep working a bit better and some cognitive work we can generally do. Um, and then if people are distressed and acutely distressed about not sleeping, that's for me the role of drug as well. Uh, not necessarily as a long-term strategy, but as a short-term strategy to help alleviate that distress. Because if people are really distressed, they find it hard to participate often in some of the behavioural change and cognitive change and lifestyle changes they need to make to sleep better. And those strategies take some time to work. Um, some time can be three weeks, four weeks, five weeks, that type of time. And if someone's really distressed, that they're not prepared to put in the work and wait that long. And then in terms of what drug I would use, yeah, I, I really liked Richard's comments about the benzodiazepines um, because it's difficult. Once you start them, it can be hard to stop them. They can make sleep feel different and that changes the expectation. So people then begin to like what sleep feels like when it's a benzodiazepine sleep rather than normal sleep, which feels different to benzodiazepine sleep. And then they, that's part of the withdrawal thing is they associate, well, I'm not sleeping the same. It feels different. So I used to like the way it felt with the benzodiazepine. So there's potentially a role then for other um, sedatives, and that's where melatonin is one uh, potential uh, medication. Uh, people are variable, variably susceptible to the sedating effect of melatonin. works very nicely for some, not so well for others. And so it it's not necessarily a guarantee it's going to work perfectly for everybody, um, but it's fairly well tolerated, fairly good side effect profile. It's indicated for the treatment of insomnia in those over the age of 55 in Australia. Um, so I think that's a good choice. Um, but I'll also use other over-the-counter preparations like valerian, valerian and hops combinations. Um, you know, I often find those helpful and there is data for those as well. Um, but I'll always try and use in parallel a non-drug strategy uh, with the talk with the patient being um, really the mainstay of treatments, the non-drug strategy, the drugs are a short-term bridge. This is a holding strategy. We're using while we're upskilling you and empowering you about self-managing um, so that you can manage your sleep going forward. It sounds like, David, there's uh, times where you're going to you know, require the expertise of one of uh, the, the, you know, expertise of uh, some of your panel members here, a sure. psychologist and a psychiatrist. I think you were interested in questions of when you should refer in your uh, in your yeah. practice. Do you want, do you want to put that question uh, uh, to your colleagues on the panel? Yeah. So, so Rod, I'll, I'll start. So, Rod, often a patient like Wayne often finds himself as first presentation coming to a sleep clinic. So it's not an uncommon referral for me to see with the referral being from general practice. You know, it sounds like there might be sleep apnea or insomnia. Um, and sure, I'm comfortable sorting out that side of it. But yeah, if I'm worried about depression, you know, when should I be referring to you? I think the key issue really is um, where you feel your boundaries of capacity are and also with the GP. So keeping the GP in the loop about who the person is seeing. I think in terms of the psychiatrist, if, if the person's... Um, if beyond what you're comfortable with, I think the thing is to think about in terms of seeing a psychiatrist is, is it someone you know? So I think in terms of psychiatrist and psychologist, someone you know, you can explain to the person what to expect is really important, probably more important than the professional. Also, yep. someone who's got an interest in older people. I mean, probably one of the most important things in effective treatment of the older person is liking to work with the older person. Then if you look at specifically, I think the specific things that psychiatrists have got is um, they do have training um, in working with older people, um, especially the younger psychiatrists, ironically enough, because the training has changed. Um, also specifically, if you're looking at interactions with medications or what are the best medication options, that's something where psychiatrists um, would see a, a special area. And although you know, this overlaps between um, psychologists, there's the issue that psychiatrists are trained as doctors first. And so particularly those who are used to working with older people will be very attuned to what is that interaction between physical health, um, acute or chronic medical conditions and medications and mental health. So I think I'll be looking at those things. And in particular, if an older person, um, there's any concerns about suicidality, unless you're someone who's very comfortable working with that, it's important to get help from a health professional soon because older people, one, have a
increased rate of suicide, especially over 75, but importantly, they don't tend to attempt suicide very often. They're much more successful once they decide to do it, to actually do it. So if there's a concern, it's important to get that um, specialist help at that stage. Thanks, Rod. Uh, uh, perhaps, David, you might uh, call upon the expertise of others uh, among the panel, a psychologists, sure. for example. So, Colette, you helped me out when I was talking about my views on the case. So, yeah, when should I be sending someone like Wayne to, uh, you know, a psychologist? Well, I think the, the point I was making before where we're looking at um, what are some of the comorbidities that are occurring around the sleep problems. So, if there are physical health problems, um, like um, you know, diabetes, arthritis, those sorts of things that might be um, interfering with um, with the the sleep quality. Then some of the things might need to be addressed. Like in the case of Wayne, where he's slightly overweight, you might refer to a, a health psychologist to um, help him manage his weight, uh, getting more um, physically active, help him with his um, um, diet, for example, using. Um, various behavioural approaches and things like um, motivational interviewing, for example, which has been shown to be quite successful in helping um, older people change their behaviours around these sorts of issues. So I think that's that the role of the health psychologist would be quite useful for those sorts of things where you've got where you're trying to address the comorbidities, which will then hopefully have an impact on the primary reason that, that um, Wayne's come to see you, which is around sleep. Thank you. So if I could just jump in very quickly, I, th I think for a psychologist or psychologist, if you're worried about cognition, the important thing is finding a psychologist or a psychiatrist who actually is interested and got skills in looking at that area yeah. uh, rather than someone with more general interest. Hmm. Thanks. Yeah, Thanks. Well, that yeah, and that, that, I think that's the other part of it. Um, again, it's not clear from the case study with Wayne, again, whether he has you know, severe memory problems or whether he's reporting them because he's a bit worried about his general health and he's noticed he's forgetful and is starting to worry about that. So again, I think um, you know, it's an assessment um, um, around um, you know, how severe this cognitive impairment is would be very useful in this case. I think just to see, hopefully, to reassure Wayne that, that it isn't such a problem. But if, if he um, if he has got significant cognitive impairment, then um, I think he'd have to be re maybe referred even to a geriatrician to deal to deal with those sorts of issues. It's Richard here. I might just leap in as a GP, seeing this on a almost daily basis. Um, there's an interesting point that you touched on, and that is that. Uh, it seems that very often the people who I end up diagnosing dementia and then referring them uh, with uh, even very early stages of dementia um, confabulate and um, excuse any uh, shortcomings that occur, whereas a person with depression is often very worried that they're going to have dementia and are very worried about some very mild indications of some sort of cognitive issues that uh, so, so um, I think the fact that he's been distressed and worried about it but probably does point more towards um, depression than dementia. What would you say, Rod? Uh, I think the stereotype is right, but I think there's also um, a lot of exceptions to it. And yes. in particular, there is an increased rate of suicide in people in the early stages of dementia who do have insight. So I think it's important to be cautious. It, it, so yes, there's a yes but. Yep. So that's uh, uh, really helpful to understand, I guess, uh, David. It, it clearly looks like there are areas uh, where uh, you know uh, interactions with 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 a psychologist, a psychiatrist, and the important point that Rod made with with really close closely linking uh, the management plan uh, with the GP, I think, is uh, is crucial there. Now, a number of the members of the audience are asking, or have asked before as well, what should sleep look like in someone Wayne's age? Now, is it, uh, is, is, is it normal for sleep need or duration of sleep to decrease? Uh, would someone who's 67 experience awakenings and, and be awake through the night? Um, I might start, Richard, with, with because you might, uh, I guess, have you know, at the coal face of getting people who have certain expectations of their sleep, uh, and how do you deal with this in terms of what what is normal as a part of uh, a part of aging? Well, it's uh, an interesting thing. If a person doesn't have any prostate issues, if they've got 
good um, lifestyle around not drinking caffeinated drinks as this guy drinks tea all day um, and they're not, uh, they, they're not uh, abusing alcohol. If there are a lot of other things not happening, um, they may well sleep through the night very happily. And, uh, you know, quite a few of my patients don't have sleep problems uh, even, even in their 80s and 90s. Um, but uh, someone in his uh, 60s, sadly, it's not uncommon for them to wake up once or twice during the night and um, go and uh, have to empty their bladder. Um, some degree of benign prostatic hypertrophy or you know, basically a, a non-malignant problem with the prostate growing bigger uh, is becoming quite a common issue by the time, people are in the, uh, by the time men are in their 60s. Um, and for w women, quite often there are um, some uh, difficulties for them around um, bladder issues relating to childbirth. And, they have developed a, um, a bladder that's taken control of their life and you know the, the, the so-called Woolworths bladder during the day where the first thing they do is look for the toilet when they're out shopping but again they're often getting up during the night so this thing of getting up to pass urine is not an uncommon thing it doesn't necessarily mean it's normal but it's not uncommon um, but there are things that can be done and uh, that's where the, you know, a GP needs to engage and say well let's see what we can do to improve things. So let me ask the sleep physician then, how much sleep does a 67-year-old male need, uh, uh, David? We hear all about how sleep is important for maintaining good health. So how do you answer that question? Uh, that, that's tough. Um, enough to feel refreshed. That, that, that's my simple answer. Um, because we've got population averages and we can sort of say what sleep's like across a population. Um, but Richard made the really good point. There's a huge no normal um, spread so that there are some people, extreme elderly, um, who sleep very well and other young people in good health who sleep very poorly. So it is a, is a bit of a spread. As a general trend, the amount of sleep we need does reduce across life. And at the age of sort of mid-60s, I'm thinking about six and a half hours is about sort of par. Um, we've got some data on women at the age of 50 that 3.7 awakenings per night is the average, um, not one, not two you know it's 3.7 um, and so that once you're older than that it's going to be even more and if we look at historical writings about sleep up until industrialization human sleep was always written about as a first sleep three or four hours of sleep that was deeper followed by a bit of being awake in the middle of the night followed by then some restlessness and dozing until the sun came up a second mm. sleep and it's only since industrialisation we've had this construct of eight hours of uninterrupted sleep. Yeah. sleep. So that sort of information is really important for people because a lot of older people will re will recognise that. I have three or four hours of reasonable sleep and then I'm sort of, it's, I'm awake and it's light, dozy sleep until the sun comes up. Mm. And historically, that's how humans sleep. Uh, can I just ask uh, Richard and Colette, uh, or oh, sorry, R Rod and Colette, uh, a number of uh, people are asking about uh, Wayne's history. We know that he was a shift worker. We know that he was forced to retire from uh, his place of work. To what extent do these factors th that may have triggered, uh, you know, a mood disturbance, potentially depression and so on, to what extent do, the, do you think these things brought on the sleep disturbance. Do you think the sleep disturbances are a, uh, you know, a follow-on effect of his change in life circumstances which may have triggered uh, uh, you know, the depression that his wife speaks about? Perhaps, Rod, if I could ask you first. I think you could look at many hypotheses and that could be one, but I don't think you can, with the information in front of you, really say the answer is yes. There's no doubt an unhappy retirement is a risk factor for depression and that could precipitate the sleep problems. But at the same time, for most people, retirement actually, um, even if they weren't planning it, um, is actually a release. And so actually 65 to 75 is probably the time of some of our best mental health. Mm. So I'd be cautious about making the interpretation worth exploring, but wouldn't jump to it being the reason. Great. Colleen, yeah. do you have any yeah, further comments? Yeah, I would, I would agree with that too. But I think... Um, Again, I think this issue around the planning of retirement is important because, um, and it's probably often in men who have, um, you know, had jobs that have been very um, engaging to them, and then they they find themselves in this new lifestyle of, of not working. I think that can be um, quite a, a stressful transition. So uh, I think planning for what you're going to actually do when you retire is an important aspect of, um, of, of 
in this case with um, with Wayne, I think as well. So um, it, as I agree that, that that's one hypothesis that, that could be actually tested to see whether maybe talk to him a bit about that, whether whether um, he's unhappy with having retired and is, is, is um, you know missing the activities that he had before. Uh, because if he, it seemed like he's sitting around a fair bit and not doing much, and I think this is a, a sign of him maybe not not really thinking about what he could re do in retirement because he's been used to um, a, you know an active job that's occupied a lot of his time. If I could just say it's briefly, Richard here. Sorry, I go, Richard. Yeah, I, I just want to make the observation that in this particular case, he retired five years earlier. And it seems that they've actually been enjoying a comfortable life, a fulfilling life, and um, been very connected with their family. And it's only in recent weeks that this is uh, that there's been this change. So uh, I think um, we're looking at something else. I agree with everything you've said about retirement and the importance of planning for it. But I think in this particular case, that may not be where this is coming from. And look, it's even possible he's developed a low-grade urinary tract infection or this might be the start of diabetes or something else. So I think uh, whoever he presents to, it's very important that the GP gives him a once-over as well just to make sure there isn't something eminently treatable that's uh, fairly acute. Richard and uh, David, can I ask you uh, a co another common question, just briefly because we're fast running out of time, is the relevance of the history of shift work to, to what extent, uh, Richard, perhaps I'd start with you, to what extent would you have uh, considered that uh, in your management, your diagnosis and management plan five years ago he retired uh, as a shift worker? My feeling is that um, it's probably somewhat ancient history now. Um, it sounds like in this case he's only developed his um, uh, sleeping difficulties relatively recently, um, whereas he's been retired for some five years. So um, I don't think in his case it's an issue, but for, certainly for some shift workers it is. And I, I think as Rod touched on before, it's really more that people get uh, this, this fixation on getting a certain number of hours sleep because as a shift worker they've got to get up at some funny time and if they don't get to sleep when they want to get to sleep, they're not going to get the sleep and then they're not going to function well at work and if, this, you know, if they're dealing with... Um, uh, uh, equipment that they have to be very alert for, uh, it causes a lot of anxiety. Um, but, you know, in this guy, that was five years ago, and it, it wasn't as if his type of shift work was um, that high-powered. He was a security guard. He wasn't operating dangerous machinery. David, I see you've posted uh, a similar kind of uh, a, a response on this. Do you want to just briefly uh, speak to that, uh, that that point? I agree with Richard. I, I think I, I agree with you absolutely, Richard. I think the very quickly after people have been on shift work, the circadian factors sort themselves out. You know, we travel from London and come back to Melbourne and back to work, and a week later, are feeling like we're settled. But what shift work does, it teaches people that sleep's precious because they have a period in life when they're counting all those hours, when am I going to get this opportunity for sleep? I'm always feeling tired. Once we start to feel like sleep is precious, then we're always sensitive to other threats around sleep. And if later on in life, five years down the track, sleep's not working well for another reason, that anxiety about sleep comes very quickly to the fore. So people who've previously worked shift work just think about sleep differently and are sort of sensitised, if you like, to um, getting anxiety about sleep when sleep's not working well for other reasons later in life. Sure. So look, uh, uh, we, we, we have rapidly run out of time and this is a fascinating case and it really does open up a, a whole range of issues. Uh, it's a complex case. I'd like to ask each of our uh, expert panel members now to briefly, uh, just in a minute or so, summarise from their perspective um, particularly in terms of the issues that we've been discussing about uh, models of collaborative care or multidisciplinary input to the management of a case like Wayne. So uh, I might uh, start with you, Richard, to uh, just give us your final thoughts. Um, sure. As I've said, uh, I, I see this as a relatively acute problem. It's only really been going for some, some weeks. And I see that it, it's not just Wayne. There's something going on with Bev. She's somehow not coping with... Uh, their relationship and uh, I think that we really need to explore a lot more what's been going on in their relationship but in terms of the acute setting and what's going on as the GP I need to involve uh, a very extensive team pathologists maybe radiologists as well as maybe mental health colleagues 
Um, and probably uh, when I start sorting them out, it may well be exercise physiologist or a physiotherapist as well um, to help them have a safe graduated exercise program to get them back into some good routines, get rid of some of that weight um, and you know, have, hopefully get them a lot healthier. He may well have diabetes or some thyroid condition, maybe a low grade urinary tract infection. Um, he may well have depression, um, possibly dementia um, and certainly the prostate may well need to be looked at in his case. Thank you, uh, Richard. Uh, Colette, could I uh, ask you for your thoughts on uh, final responses to Wayne's case and, and Bev? Um, well, first of all, I'd, I'd just like to say that I've really enjoyed this session because I've got the perspectives from the other panel members, which has been very interesting. Yeah. Um, I also agree that um, I think this whole couple relationship is an important issue and um, there's been some recent work done in this area, really the, the social role of sleep, I guess I'd call it. And obviously, um, um, I think Bev's being disturbed by some of the... Um, sleep issues that Wayne is having but um, also there seems to be some maybe a little bit of friction there as well so I think it's important um, in cases like like this that you're actually um, you know think of these relationships and how they might impact on um, on what the presenting problem is in this case for Wayne also again from a health psychology perspective I think uh, looking at, at, at physical and mental health comorbidities is very important and I think all of the panellists have, have demonstrated um, that. Well, we've all talked about that, that we're not looking at it just from the perspective of our, our own discipline, but I think we, we all understand that, um, that particularly in older age, there's a complexity of issues that we need to look at. So I think that's probably the main thing and, and with psychologists they're often, um, people don't necessarily just turn up to psychologists of their own that they're relying on um, um, other medical professionals referring. And I guess I'd just um, say that um, from that point of view, health psychologists have a lot to contribute um, in these areas of physical and mental health com comorbidities and assist cases like, um, like Wayne. Yes, well, I think, uh, Colette, I uh, t uh, certainly agree with your point. David, I think, made the point earlier about uh, non-pharmacological treatments in general uh, for the management of sleep disturbances. The evidence base is very, very strong that these uh, approaches that David described uh, can be uh, highly effective in the long term, as effective, if not more effective in the long term, as uh, uh, pharmacological treatment. So that's just one example of the clear role that the psychologist can play. Uh, Rod, uh, over to you for your uh, final response to, the, uh, to Wayne's uh, case study. I think the case emphasises to me the importance of balancing uh, really a, a healthy optimism about ageing and recognising that 67, Wayne isn't very old. Um, I don't see many people under 75 really. Um, but um, balance that with not ignoring the things which are different in old age. Be optimistic about his cognitive impairment because you know, he's probably only got about 2% chance of having dementia, but don't ignore it. It does need following up because if he is in that 2%, you need to do all you can to help him. Um, and I think I, I do and I don't. I think one thing that hasn't been mentioned is don't use antipsychotics for sleep disturbance, which is, I think, a trend which is, um, seems to be starting to build up to avoid the benzodiazepines. And a do, which is do make sure that you help older people keep their role or keep a role in life because I think that is the one thing which um, helpful health professionals and helpful families often do is actually bring a support network around that actually takes away the person's purpose. And so if there's one thing I'd like people to think about oh. is really think about how we avoid doing that and encourage actually helping an older person where that has happened to refine their purpose, which is often their role in their family and helping them to recognise that again. Thank you, Rod. That's a wonderful perspective. David, can I uh, hear from you as a sleep physician for your final response to, uh, to this case we've been talking about? So a lot is a case we see a lot, and Richard was saying, you know, sees many times a day even, which I, I believe. That I find this such a hard case because unless I've really got a team and close relationships with uh, psychologists that I know and trust or psychiatrists that I know and trust and are happy to refer patients to, this sort of case is really hard to manage and get engagement and get behaviour change. And um, I agree with you, Rod. You know, you've got, you know, quite optimistic about what the outcomes are going to be because I think we'll actually get there. But it does take a team to sort of get that 
um, engagement. Um, and that's where I've, you know, I've, one of the things I've, I've learned, it's just the luxury of if you've got a good team that you can work with and a good referral network, it just helps so much in how you can manage a case like this. Thank you. Uh, thank you, David. I think um, what really strikes me about this particular case and, and, and the, the panel's reaction to it is that uh, it is a complex case and there are many, many aspects that require investigation and potential you know, ma management approaches. I think you've all talked about the challenges that this case would pose to you in your discipline-specific roles. Uh, you've talked about uh, the great value of multidisciplinary input, and I think that's precisely the point of uh, of, of of discussion of these sorts of case studies is to consider how uh, we might engage other uh, health professionals, particularly mental health professionals, in the management of a case like Wayne's. Um, Colette, uh, your points about looking at the totality of the situation, and Richard's looking at Bev as well as. Uh, uh, Wayne, looking at the relationship factors, looking at uh, the life factors, and so on, uh, are, are absolutely, uh, you know, well taken and, and and really highly relevant in the management of this case. So, uh, I uh, we we have just a couple of minutes to conclude. Uh, I think the panel has provided an excellent summary of the response to this uh, particular case. Um, I uh, am extremely grateful to our panel members once again. Uh, Richard Kidd, Colette Browning, uh, Rod McKay, and David Cunnington for their absolutely, uh, you know, insightful uh, comments and responses to this particular case study. Uh, I'm grateful also to the uh, Mental Health Professionals Network for coordinating uh, a webinar on this really uh, important topic, and I think we all agree uh, that this is uh, an important topic and uh, one that really does require uh, a lot of education and uh, reflection. So uh, I'd like to remind you all uh, to ensure that you complete the exit survey before you log out. This helps us a great deal in planning uh, future uh, webinars. Certificates of attendance for this webinar will be issued in four to five weeks. Uh, each participant will be sent uh, a link as well. Now, if you're interested in leading a face-to-face -face, uh, network in your local area with a focus on older people and uh, uh, mental health or sleep disturbance, the Mental Health Professional Network uh, can help you and support you in doing so. So please fill out the expression of interest uh, that you will receive uh, as a link in the webinar follow-up email. Now lots of questions came up uh, that unfortunately we didn't have time to answer all of them, but a number of questions came up from the audience along the themes of practical strategies for managing sleep disturbance. And uh, within the resources that you are directed to for this webinar, there are links to uh, the Australasian Sleep Association website as well as the Sleep Health Foundation website. And both of these websites provide very good resources for health professionals as well as patients in terms of evidence-based strategies to manage uh, sleep complaints, including sleep hygiene, which a number of the audience uh, members have been discussing. So on that note, I'd like to thank uh, the audience for their excellent questions and their participation. Once again, to all of the members of the panel, uh, thank you for your contribution and participation. A pleasure. Thanks. Thank you, Shanta.